yeah, it's reinventing a whole program. It's been, it's been crazy, but I'm, I'm looking forward. I, you know, if you can think out, which I've tried to train myself to stop doing to some degree, but you know what, it'll be interesting to see how this experience changes summer fish trap going forward. I think it's going to be really interesting and, and for you guys to all be a part of that. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's going to change no matter what happens. We're going to be doing this differently. So yeah. there might be improvements that, you know, it might open some doors that will last forever. That it's what I'm like, hoping. Like a canvas area or something, you know, there will be things yeah. that get retained. I think it'll be good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I see Craig. Hi, Craig. Hi. Yeah. How are you? I'm doing well. Good. How's it going? It's going well. You're inside. Uh <laughs> It's it's windy outside. <laughs> it's all hot and there are bugs and sticks and rocks. <laughs> hot bug and sticks and rocks, yeah. You know, so you guys maybe. are both and you and Laura. Laura was talking it was like a hundred degrees. So Yeah, it's pretty warm around here. I'm I'm up at seven thousand feet, so it's not yeah. Hideously hot. But uh I think it's like what, sixty three, sixty four here right now today, so Oh, yeah, just the, the clouds just finally started breaking up, but it's, so I, I, you know, it, you could tell that if you were up at the lake right now, you'd be bundled up. So there you have it. I'll imagine it. I You'll wish. Imagine it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not supposed to get out of the 70s, I think, all week. It's kind of perfect. So we'll just rub that in. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no problem. I'm here to serve. Well, I let me uh, officially welcome everybody to our first featured faculty reading. Last night was our opening with uh, uh, Frank X. Walker, which I'm still thinking about. Um, and so we decided to to get off uh, the week with a start, start it in a way, start the readings off with Craig, and then he'll be finishing everything up with our keynote on Saturday. Um, this recording is going to be made available to the public this evening, um, we think. And, <laughs> and uh, so to anybody that might be watching this later, or also for all of you, if you have friends and family across the country who would like to check out Craig's keynote, we have um, tickets on sale. So if you look at our website, um, there's a link there that people can register for tickets to the keynote. And it they will get a, an email back with them that will uh, give them access that night, just that night for the keynote presentation. And tickets are $25 and, uh, you know, invite your friends and family to join us. Um, will be a nice thing to do. So there's no limited seating on this one. So they can come in and, and, and join in. So I, Craig, I was thinking um, that I was, I was just looking back at the last few years. This is the third summer in a row you've been hanging out with us um, because you did a Zoom one outpost, I think in 2018. And uh, you did this, the, our very first Snake River outpost last year. And now you're here and we were supposed to be on the snake again in September, but that's being postponed to next year. So if we get it right, I think we're just gonna build a spot for you um, permanently if you're okay with that. Great. What do you think? I'm up for it. <laughs> and another run down the, the snake is, is very welcome. Yeah, yeah. I, we were all disappointed to see that trip go. So, um, but hopefully, um, hopefully it'll, it'll happen again next summer. And I was just looking on the website, the registration's still up, so you never know. But, <laughs> but it's scheduled to go uh, next September. So um, fingers crossed that, that life will be somewhat back to normal by then. So. It's a beautiful river. It is a beautiful river. Um, so. Uh, Craig is going to do a, a reading, and then I think if it's up okay with you, we'll 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 open it up for questions um, at the end for a few minutes. Um, we need to make sure we're going to try to wrap this up in, in about a half an hour, forty minutes, um, so people have time to take a breather before Laura Pritchett's craft talk at one o'clock. Um, so that is our plan. If you have questions, I think I'm going to ask that you put them in our chat box. If you have not accessed that, I think everybody here knows where that is. But at the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll see a little chat and that will open up a window and you can ask questions there. Um, and we'll get those to Craig and, and handle that at the end of the presentation, if you're okay with that, Craig, if that works for you. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, so, Craig is an explorer and a storyteller, as it says in our program. Um, he's gotten uh, 
more than a dozen critically acclaimed books, including Virga and Bone, which is your most recent, I understand. Your work, uh, his work has appeared in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Men's Journal and the Sun. Um, Craig is the contributing editor for Adventure Journal Quarterly and lives in Western Colorado, which is where I was hatched, um, believe it or not, and teaches writing for both the University of Alaska in Anchorage and in Southern New Hampshire University. And he is now one of us permanently. So please, I'm going to turn this over to Craig Childs. Where were you hatched? Uh, Denver, actually. So front range, really, not really. But And then they, they spirited me away at six weeks. So, <laughs> but yeah, I had family there just up until a few years ago that my grandmother passed. So yeah. Well, still have cousins there. They'll probably be upset if I say that publicly. So <laughs> keep it in this circle. Keep it in the circle. Yes. Well, thank you for for having me here to do this. Um, I've been. Uh, we just started our full workshop today on uh, stories of animal encounters, and and so I thought I'd bring some new stories that I've I've just recently written and some old stories, but I, I'd like to bring uh, animal stories into this reading. And let me just jump right in with, uh, with a February bear that waits silent in its den, a copious wood rat nest pushed up around its back like a blanket. Outside snow is falling, dizzy with fat flakes turning in windless air. The bear doesn't know about the storm, a barometer in its organs, spaces between gut folds, might register a change in molecules, ozone in the air, atmospheric pressure lifted to let in the clouds, but the mind does not see it, not any more than the brainstem, the reptilian part that instructs the heart to beat. Hibernation is not sleep, not dreaming. It is a closing of every door, but the one in and out. Breath so gently, so gentle it barely moves, dusty cobwebs that line the cracks. A life made of sinew and seasons, carcasses scavenged, other bears chased off, and being chased off itself is settled into the hole it formed, the shape of its body and twigs and old bones, grayed feces, pine cones, bits of cactus with spines bent down. A male will hibernate at the same temperature as a female, not cold to the touch, but not warm, reduced to the simple fact of Ursus. There's no longing for the rotten logs of summer turned over, revealing countless squirming pearls of ant larvae or the familiar scratching post of an old tree. The brain's cortex with its familiar desires is turned off. Little will wake the bear, a predator, a larger, already woken bear clawing into this den, looking for drowsy meat. Warmer times of the year are spent in alertness for this kind of thing. Flick of the ears, nose twisting the air like a finger. Every follicle is awake, and a fly landing at the tip of a long guard hair causes the bear to shrug. The den is refuge from all of that, a cocoon for the winter, deep hold darkness place to curl and be forgotten by the outside. A storm would not concern the bear. Let snow pile up and drift this rock mouth, wind blown whole, root cracked, shared with a crowded wood rat. The more snow, the quieter the world. Defenses come down, nothing needs to be known. The bear hears the squeak of tiny wood rat young wrestling for milk from their mother, but does not think about them. Thinking is for other seasons. A shadow flickers at the mouth of the den. Something is here. Some cells are awake enough to detect movement, not wind. An animal of size, footfall, footfalls, body grazing rock and blocking snow light from the outside, enough to rise from the dead rest of torpor, nostrils creaking, paws twitching, sinew coughing to life, enough to form a dream of a question. Who is here? The umbrella was left outside, tilted over my day pack to keep snow off. I was halfway into the entrance to a natural rock shelter, its ceiling marked with black tongues, signs of ancient fire smoke. It wasn't much of a space, knee high at most, but it was deep and protective. 
Inside, I thought I might find artifacts, woven ute sandals century, uh, centuries old, half swallowed in blow sand, a collection of water jars from Pueblo occupation a thousand years ago, or a leather bundle of adaletal darts and stone projectiles stashed by an archaic hunter-gatherer after the end of the Ice Age. Smoke stains on rock are a giveaway. People used this space. I poked in on hands and knees, careful where I lay, palm, flesh, and fingertips for the cactus pieces brought in by, by a wood rat to guard the space. Its nest had been built up taller than I expected, a hill of sticks and bones forming a barrier, bettering the chance that something might survive inside. <clears throat> Outside, the white was almost blinding, clouds socked to the ground, knotty pinion pines sinking under a long, steady storm. Inside, I closed my eyes, a trick to adjust to the dark. Bright to black, flash blinded me, crawling over the hump of the nest, reaching back for my headlamp. Before I could grab it, I felt warmth on my face, the smell of breathing. This could have been a mountain lion den, though the blonde of a cat would have shone through. Whatever was in here blended into the dark. I willed my pupils to widen, but they would not go any faster. Color cones slow to let go of daylight, black and whites detecting a shape, a shadow within a shadow, something with eyes. Memory searched for anything, an animal that absorbs light, raccoon, skunk, porcupine. For part of a second, my brain thought, panther because I could see the eyes clearer now, dark holes set far enough apart that this was no small animal. It had a ring of lighter fur around the eyes, then black, but there were no panthers here. In that moment, the face of a black bear resolved. It looked at me with aimless confusion, head lifted out of the curl of its body, peering over its shoulder, its furry hind between my hands on the ground. Never had the expression of an animal been so clear to me. All of what we call emotion settled into a damp, perplexed expression. The bear sang, no, not this. In hibernation, a bear does not dream. Neurobiology all but shut down. Internal temperature can drop to just above freezing and the bear will survive. Not until it rises above 85 degrees does the brain start to register activity that could be considered dreaming. Above that is being awake. This bear was not awake. It had to climb rungs of consciousness just to open its eyes, passing through states of awareness that must have been veiled like a dream. Excuse me, I said quickly and out loud. Something had to be said. The bear was obviously having trouble coming to terms with what I was. A long armed primate had just crawled into its sanctuary. I backed directly out of the clamshell space into electrified air. The bear's eyes receded from me. Snow hissed as it fell, landing with a continuous shush. I threw on my pack in crystalline white light and lifted my umbrella, creating a hole in the storm. For two seconds, maybe three, there was no reason to move, no sound from inside. I stared at the entrance, stunned, not thinking a black bear would have denned this low in elevation side of a, ma side of a mesa in high desert, 6,000 feet at most. But how much do I know about bears, where they sleep, when they wake? Snow sounded like feathers under my boots as I walked away. The bear stayed with me. I could see it blinking at the space I must have left empty in front of its nose. A scent of human, but no one here. The sound of a voice, the gibbering of a two-legged, echoing in the vault of its head, but only quiet remains. Listening, waiting, nothing. Nose lowered, to the nest of its arm, its paw as so a soft place to rest, the bear again made a blanket of itself and returned to forgetting. That's something I just uh, I wrote recently and um, uh, I, I've got a, another piece that's attached to it uh, directly under, so I'll just keep going with that. Look at your hands. 
the creases where you hold a fork, a pen, a steering wheel, the honeycomb surface of cells, some with hair and some without, made for grasping, palming, reaching. There are 27 bones in each hand, 123 named ligaments. Is there any doubt we are made out of nature? Our bodies are animal. There may be no conscious register, but we pick up every scent, brains lighting to four millimeters molecules out of a million. The feel of skins and furs on our backs has become customary and mattresses elevate us beyond myth, but we haven't forgotten. You never do. Spending a thousand nights under the stars was not that long ago, still within reach, like a dream you can barely grasp, but you know is real. When I was six or seven years old, my mom and her boyfriend took me off to the backwoods of Nebraska in his white Dodge pickup, its cab smelling of chew, empty beer bottles darkened inside. I can't remember exactly where we went, somewhere with lots of ponderosa pines. They threw a mattress on the ground for us to sleep on. What I remember is ground slippery with long pine needles, and after darkness fell, they wandered off maybe to walk hand in hand in the stars, or to sit together in their jackets close enough to hear me if I made a peep. Point is, I didn't know where they were. They'd put me to bed under so many blankets it felt as if I were under a mountain. I must have known not to call out, somehow aware that my mom needed this, or I was too scared to make a sound. In my mind, alone in what felt like infinite darkness, a pale little Saturday morning cartoon kid, I found a new kind of fear of the dark. Not monsters in the closet or under the bed, but fear of a power and scale I'd never felt. The forest had an audible silence. At what age do you understand, in the part of your brain that doesn't use words, that you are uncountable in the scheme of things? Annie Dillard wrote, evolution loves death more than it loves you or me. When do you know this is true, holding a picked and wilted flower in your hand, or ants burning uselessly under a magnifying glass? Not quite old enough for despair, I felt the precursor to despair, emptiness. It was like nothing was out there, nothing listening, nothing feeling. I was pinned down beneath it, but the weight of blankets felt safe, like a hand on my chest. I did the only thing I could do. I looked at the stars. That's what I remember most. How many of them, how many of them were there? Bright ones out front, dimmer ones fading into phosphorescent blue that powdered the entire sky. It felt like our whole galaxy was within view. Pine stood black as all emptiness, cutting into the darkness with their deeper darkness, opening a hole, a canopy, where the night sky illuminated itself. I saw these things as if surprised to know they were here, always here. Even during the day, there were stars. The fear drifted away, replaced by a new kind of assurance, courage, calmness. There was a presence that was not me, not my mother, my family, friends, school, sidewalk, lawns, and it took up the whole of the world. I was in the middle of it, a faint star myself, a grain among the countless. I became safe. You wonder what those moments do to you, what turn lane you took blinker signaling toward where you will be heading for the rest of your life. Before that, I never needed stars. I will, uh, I'm going to read from, uh, from some older stuff here. Um, this is from my book, Animal Dialogues. And Today in the workshop, we were talking about ordinary stories. Uh, I had originally planned on reading, reading a, a mountain lion encounter where, uh, where a, a mountain lion had, had come around behind me and, and came up to within maybe four or five feet. And uh, I think the, the cat was curious, but I think I was, I was terrified. And, um, uh, but uh, after, after talking, to, with the class about ordinary experiences, I decided to drop this mountain lion story because I think the ordinary stories are, 
are the ones that are more telling, um, maybe more sharp, more immediate than, than you know, ending up in in the the bush with a jaguar or uh, or or having a, a confrontation with a grizzly bear. I think the real stories are the small ones, and this one is called Violet Green Swallow. Every day, I walk to the water. There was once a stock tank here, shoveled out and reinforced by homesteaders who left their buckets and square nails out in the forest. Now it is, a sim is simply a pond in the meadow, heavily fringed with sedges forgotten by livestock. Every day, even when it rains, I come down and leave my clothes in a pile, my feet gingerly sorting through the basket weaves of dead reeds. I slip in at the south end and kick off, propelling myself to the center. It is just deep enough. I have to maintain some momentum, otherwise my feet and knees drag in the dark mud. Frogs leap away, plunking like small stones to the bottom. I come in the mornings or just after lunch. The world shifts and rolls, calling up weather, sending it away, and the pond remains. It will stay for another month and then will be dry for autumn. I'm cutting wood for the winter, sawing by hand through winter kill aspens, carefully stacking split wood. At the end of the day, Violet green swallows come down and flash over the pond. It is an aerobatic performance, whirling and crossing compact iridescent birds diving for insects and diving also for no obvious reason above the water's surface. Their terse wings are like those of a plummeting falcon. I could sit out and watch them for days, if not for all the wood that needs cutting. The species is legendary for its aeronautics. With sharp turns, scissoring holes and spirals out of the sky, I have heard hundred mile an hour winds tune themselves through the wings of a, of a diving swallow. I have nearly been smacked in the face by swallows who are using my head as a pivot point at mountain ridges. There has been a storm. At the pond, the violet green swallows are turning the sky into a ball of twine. I'm naked beneath the mountains, hands clutch to my shoulders in the breeze. Squalls break apart so that tracks of sunlight roam the ground and the aspens glow for two minutes and then turn dark. The clouds curl and cave in on themselves. I enter the water and drift at eye level with turquoise damselflies that swing between gritty horsetails. The damselflies land on my eyebrows and perch on my shoulder blades. Above, the swallows wheel over one another. A delicate freedom is traced out by their motions. The liberation is so visible because they are working within the confines of specificity, taking tangible details of physics and building wings out of them. They have allied gravity and motion without dissection. There is nothing I can honor more than this. Seeing a swallow in flight is no different than placing your hand on a beating heart. 50 of them are working a cat's cradle into the air. The perfect reflection below makes it 100 swallows. They parade and swivel off their tiny wings. There are no sudden veers to avoid collisions and none of the birds are coming within a foot of one another. A web of flight regulations hovers above the pond. The law has been set. The curve of a violet green swallow is reminder enough to heed everything, to cinch down your life and your body like a, like a harpsichord string and pluck it. Down here, there is no sound other than the flutter of birds three feet over my head. With my eyes exactly at water level, I slide alongside swallows who drag over the surface, leaving a wake where they've troubled the water. Images of mountains wrinkle in front of me. I think we all have simple encounters like this all the time. I think every day, I mean, you're, you're running into uh, a European house swallow, you're, you're running into a, a gray blue heron, uh, um, you see a spider in the corner. Uh, I think all these moments could be written about. I think the ordinary moments have the most extraordinary 
material inside of them, the life of an animal, the life of something that isn't you. We, we end up spending so much time in the human realm that it's easy to forget there's a, a whole world, most of the world is happening out there. I wanted to read one last one here. Um, this, is a, this is from a different environment. Um, walking with a friend in Manhattan, I brushed through a cool September evening. Yellow taxi cabs pulsed beside us as thousands of people darted by like colorful reef fish. The air smelled of flowers and of dark subway breath coming up through the grates in the sidewalk. We were out for a night's walk, street by street, angling south toward the tip of the city. There we would find the source of two columns of light beaming into the sky. Yes. You look up and you lose your spot. The date, that's what it was. The date was September 11th, 2002, exactly a year after the World Trade Center towers fell into a smoldering heap. It was hard to miss the lights, twin memorials rising side by side, their candle power so strong they projected off the planet and into space. No matter where you stood on the island, they seemed to vanish at a point directly overhead. We were in no hurry to reach them stopping at cafes and bars along the way until it was well after midnight. The intimate stage lighting of the West Village gave way to broad, busy streets and huge, grimy buildings in lower Manhattan where the congestion only increased. The conversation between my friend and me rippled and churned through the terrain of sound. The pop and clap of many footsteps blended into a thousand rumbling car engines. Sirens and human voices filled the middle octaves while underneath was an almost audible groan of buildings straining against gravity. Near ground zero, sightseers crowded among vendors and pickpockets. Though we were still a few blocks away from the source, the two lights overhead, over, overhead overwhelmed our sky like towering obelisks. When we looked closer, we realized the lights were filled with movement. Countless birds raced in and out, bright meteoric paths cut into the sky. They must have been drawn by this memorial, pulled out of their nightly habits to enter this acrobatic flourish. As we walked closer, the birds became more brilliant and numerous, a mass of charged speeding particles. As each crossed into the light, it was suddenly branded white, turned into pure light. We followed the crowd until we reached a battery of huge spotlights and blinding electric powered faces pointing at the peak of the sky. From here, we looked straight up into two twin pillars of illuminated birds, a dizzying field of motion that was doubled, quadrupled by the reflective glass of skyscrapers on all sides. I had to spread my feet apart so I would not tip over, disoriented by all the motion. Never had I seen such a gathering, plumes of birds billowing upward, multiplying upon themselves until they appeared infinite, as thick as Milky Way stars. They reflected so much light that their individual features were erased. I guessed them to be terns, flycatchers, whippoorwills, nighthawks, jaegers, and crows interrupted by swerving raptors. I picked out some by their flight patterns, seagulls, coasting back and forth, and falcons plunging through flurries of swallows. None could resist the light. This must upend everyone's schedules, I thought. Daytime species would wake hungover in the morning, bewildered by the night's new sun. They must be feeding, I said, trying to find an explanation for what we were seeing, but few species of bird besides whippoorwills and nighthawks were night feeders. Those that I saw, perhaps the majority, were migrating, and the lights had apparently pulled them off course. September is prime season for migration, and many travel at night, relying on stars and moonlight for orientation. Now they were fixed solely on these two lights, the axis of their navigation 
fastened over lower Manhattan. Many would probably die because of this, their energy diverted, wings exhausted. We were killing them. My friend did not reply, standing next to me with a thin strap purse over her shoulder, her head tipped all the way back. She had grown up in the city and called herself a New Yorker with the cool omnipotence so many residents of this city possess, yet she had never seen anything remotely like this, a night sky peopled with birds. Though many were killing themselves with exhaustion, I thought these birds must be in some sort of ecstasy, thrust so willingly in and out of the light. I wondered whether survivors re would remember this night of illumination, whether the small avian brain has a place to hold an unconformity of this magnitude. Then I thought there must be no need for such memory among animals as swift and transfigured as these. This moment went beyond mere recollection. I glanced around to see who else noticed the phenomenon. Most of the thousands standing around me pressed into each other's backs, navigating a cluttered horizon of heads and shoulders. Meanwhile, a handful of people were stopped. They looked like oracles, standing still in the moving crowd, their faces upturned. I craned my neck and joined them, my eyes climbing rungs of innumerable birds. We were the lucky ones. We happened to look up and witness an event so blindingly extraordinary that most people could not see it. On this night, our world had a new axis to turn upon. We were ruled not by gravity or any other familiar law, but by birds. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you being here. Greg, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing all that. I, I had a couple of questions for you, if you don't mind if I ask. Certainly. Yeah, I mean, and again, if anyone has a question, please feel free to, to uh, write in the, the chat box and we'll be sure to pass it on so um, everybody can hear it. Uh, I was curious, especially with that last piece that, you know, being in New York City and being someone who I think is best known for your, your work interacting with the natural world, um, how do you find people in the urban communities responding to, you know, when you're working with students, it would, do they interact with nature? How do they, they come to that world with you? Do you find any uh, differences in the way they approach their writing about that? Um, they may be more appreciative of it. <laughs> Maybe yeah. that's what I've noticed is uh, it's, it's less common, maybe less jaded. Uh, less um, less familiar, so, so sometimes the writing stands out more. I, I think that I, people in cities are as, as enthralled as anybody else by, by animal life. Uh, and and the, the city stories are actually great. I love, I love New York stories uh, of, of animal encounters and, and I've heard quite a few. I've been in, in different uh, workshops where, where people have, have uh, put out these, these urban stories that are just brilliant because, you know, animals are, are animals. Yeah. They, they are the, the, I mean, they're wild in, in some places, but even the wild ones are in the cities. The, the coyotes that, that, uh, that show up in cities are not domestic coyotes. They're, they're habituated, but they're, they're wild. Um, and I, and I think that, uh, that people anywhere still they 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 search for them and they and the stories are are as visceral from from urban dwellers um i do have a question from mall she said that um can you talk about how you came to the idea to set up the encounter with the bear coming from the bear's perspective um yeah because i get tired of my perspective <laughs> <laughs> you know we you hear enough of, of the writer, and I think what's really going on there is is the bear's experience, and then I happen to stumble into it. Uh, animal encounters, you know, face to face encounters like that. It's not just the person, not just the me as witness as writer. It's a lot of what's going on is on the other side of what they're experiencing. So, I wanted to 
to get into the mind of a bear and what it's like to be hibernating and what it's like to be woken. And, and I don't think I could do that from my perspective as well, because I would be, it would be jarring because I'd, I'd be coming into the alcove, I'd see the bear and I would go, ah, oh, hibernation. Let's talk about that for a moment. Or, you know, I'd go off on some, some uh, tangent that, that looks into the bear's life when that's not what I wanted to do. I, I wanted the both experiences to be immediate. So I, I stayed with the bear up front, kind of to take myself out of it. <laughs> Uh, Kyle wrote a question. Um, was that last piece uh, set in New York City, was that from your own personal experience? Was that a, a fictional piece? Was it uh, something you observed? Uh, that was my own experience, yeah. Um, all, all the stories in that book are, are my own experiences. I would love to write a book someday of, some, of other people's. Because, um, you know, the, those moments, you, you do have to stretch them out a little bit, you know, fill in. Uh, whereas some people's stories, I, I've heard such extraordinary animals encounter stories from, from people and I would love to, to write them down and, and interview them and, and find a way to, you know, that would be a, a different approach. That'd be more like having the bear experience up front and keeping myself out as the observer. But that, that story was, uh, yeah, that was, I was, I was there for that. Uh, Kathy said something about, do you know whether the memorial is still killing birds? I think it is. Yeah. I, I don't think that I, I've heard it's been addressed and they have no idea what to do with it. And I don't know what they would do with it. I, I don't think you could, if you're putting that much light into the city, it's going to draw birds. Um, it's so it's, uh, I have, I've never been back to see it again. And I don't know if, I imagine it's still the case. If, if they're shining in September, then, then uh, migratory birds will be, be coming through there. Uh, so Chase asked, is there a push and pull for you of telling personal stories and relating facts about the animal you're meeting? Hmm. Push and pull. Well, there are a lot of pushes and pulls. I think, yeah. I think anybody who's writing is feeling a push and pull. Um, I, it's, I, if this is referring to what I think it is, um, we were actually talking about this in, in the, the class today that, uh, that there's this sense of violation sometimes with these wild animals. I showed a, a, a video um, and maybe I can put it up for all of Fish Tap to see. I just recorded it yesterday morning of paddling up to a, um, uh, to a beaver lodge at sunrise and listening into it. And hearing the, uh, hearing the young suckling inside and hearing the groans and water splashing and you could hear the, the space inside of the, of the lodge while an adult was out, an adult beaver was swimming around me and, and just splashed it. They, they'll take their tail and they'll smack their tail against the surface as they dive as a, as a warning. And, um, and you know, it, there is that violation of going, I want to get close to this. I want to hear inside of a beaver lodge. Um, but then they don't want me there. Mm -hmm. uh, the push and pull is, is I want to encounter these animals and these animals generally don't want to encounter me. And, and uh, that's, that's, the, that's the debate I have. I prefer when animals come to me or when we just happen upon each other. But I've been listening to this lodge for the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, just going by and putting my ear up against it. And I want to encounter it, but I do not want to disturb it. Mm -hmm. but I am disturbing it. So yeah, there's a push and pull there. Uh, we'll figure out how to, how to get that up on, on, on the website. So I'll, so I'll get it to you. We'll feel, feel free to send it to us and we'll get, we'll take care of that. Okay. Are there any other questions before we, Wrap this up. I don't see anything else coming through. I'll give it a second here. Oh. <laughs> yes, you can hear the birds in the background. It's funny, we were talking about that. I, last night, um, right after we finished up with um, Frank X's uh, reading, um, there's a, if you can see behind me, there's a kind of an empty little lot that's sitting back there with really high grass. And 
um, one of my dog decided that, you know, he's got a little buck that they run back and forth and play together, a young yearling. But now he's decided that all deer want to play with him. And I looked and I heard him and I went out and said, what's going on? And there was a doe. Um, and I know there, I saw fawns earlier in the day. So, and sure enough, and it was really interesting watching. I called the dogs in how she stood there and watched me. I mean, for the longest time, usually they go and she stood there and watched me. And I thought, thought for a minute, you know, I knew the babies were probably in the high grass right around there somewhere, but she, st she stood there and stared at me. And I had that same feeling like I want to watch and I want to engage, but I'm in her backyard, not the other way around. And I need to get out of the way and remember that this is their place. So it's an interesting, it's a daily thing, you know? Yeah. I, I want to be one of the animals with them, which we are. Yeah. We're human. We're definitely a different animal, and and our worlds are always overlapping. And there's the Venn diagram that has the animal encounter story as as where these worlds meet. I also have to admit, if my neighbors were coming up, putting their ears onto my house, listening to what I was doing, I'd yeah. probably be super happy about that. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's creepy. I don't. I don't it's a creepy that. thought. Yeah. <laughs> so don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, just again to remind everybody in about 20 minutes, Laura Pritchett is going to be doing her craft talk that along with um, these will be made available. Um, we're going to give ourselves with about 24 hours. Yesterday it took, um, oh gosh, it took about five hours for Frank's video to process because Willow County internet speeds are a fabulous thing. So um, just give us a little patience. Um, and then again, at, at uh, four o'clock, we'll be back with Beth Piatote and Craig, thank you again so much for doing this. And I look forward to hearing you Saturday night. Oh, thanks for having me here to do it. All right. You all have a good day. We'll see you soon.